Hello everyone. Hopefully I'm audible. We'll just give a few more seconds for everyone to stream in and kick it off. Right. Why don't Why don't we jump in and do do intros? All right. Um, so, quick, quick introduction to the two of us here. Um, so, I'm. I'm, I'm Santhya, I'm a GP at Unusual Ventures. We are a seed stage fund with about a billion dollars under management. And one of the things I have been doing is investing a lot in what we are calling AI native software. So I thought, you know, given all the questions that I am um, I have and I'm uh, getting from founders as well who are trying to take advantage of the advances that we are seeing in AI, we'll uh, try to go to the source and talk to someone who's actually been thinking about this for, you know, over 15 years. Uh, so everyone, please um, say hello and welcome to our little chat, uh, Dao Keeler, who's the head of research right now at Hugging Face. Please say hello, Dao. Hi, thanks for having me. Looking forward to this. Me too. Um, so a little bit about kind of, you know, why we are here and about Hugging Face before we jump in. Um, so, you know, the way I think about it, that uh, while you know the field of AI probably started in like the 1950s, uh, the last few years have seen just massive ad advances in how accessible uh, the technology has become. And a lot of this nomenclature is still, you know, being formed. And I'm sure, uh, you know, we'll learn more really soon about uh, what is the right way to think about these uh, models? But there are definitely really strong set of new models and infrastructure available as a service uh, that is faster, cheaper, and easier to deploy um, by orders of magnitude than they were even just last year. Uh, and you know the benefit of these models is they are pre-trained pre -trained on large uh, volumes of data, and they can be fine-tuned and adapted relatively easily for a really broad set of downstream applications. Um, and you know there are multiple companies. The ones you see on this slide are actually just a small representative sample of uh, folks who are building uh, tools for everyone here in the audience to take advantage of. So whether you're a founder, whether you're a founding engineer, thinking about how to use AI in your startup, like the, these other companies that are working on uh, helping you do that. Um, and you know, Hugging Face in particular, I think, um, is a great example of a company that is really trying to take a community first approach. Um, so I don't know if uh, if um, the view like this um, uh, description, but I think I, I saw somewhere Hugging Face described as the GitHub for machine learning. Um, and you have, you know, um, close to 10,000 teams that have joined this community or trying out tools, particularly the Transformers library, the Inference API are really popular. So I wanted to kind of set that context. Um, and with that, we will uh, actually jump in, you know, quick, quick uh, view on like what are the topics we'll be covering. So we are going to start with just uh, hearing from uh, Dao about all the, uh, you know, advances that he has seen in the last uh, 15 years and a little bit about uh, Hugging Face's approach to open source uh, in the machine learning world and how developers can benefit. We'll also dig dig into you know foundation models, LLMs, like what are all the use cases, how to think about performance, training, UX, etc. Uh, and a little bit about you know what are the what are the things that people are working on that we can look forward to in the future. Uh, however, we would love to take questions. Um, from the beginning. So if you can post questions in the Q&A tab, you can even leave questions in the form of video or you know, text. 
Uh, we'll pull questions in that kind of flow through this conversation um, as we go. You don't have to wait till the end for questions. We would love to hear from everyone up front so we can make this session as useful as possible to all of you. So please, please post questions um, and we'll make sure every few minutes to pull up ones that um, you know, make the most sense and seem the most useful and, and surface them immediately. Um, and with that, I will uh, stop sharing these slides so you can see us and and dive in. Um, so, Do, can you can you tell us a little bit about you know what your AI journey has been and how you see the evolution of modern AI as we, as we are as we are calling it? Like, when did it really start? Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, so my story is a bit unusual, actually, which, which uh, might be interesting. So uh, uh, when I was in high school, I, um, I taught myself how to code, uh, which meant that I already thought I knew everything and I didn't have to study computer science. So instead, I studied philosophy uh, because I was very interested in the human mind and trying to understand like uh, uh, how it really works. Um, and um, uh, from philosophy, I, I kind of but I always stayed interested in, in AI and like trying to see if we can uh, implement minds on machines. Um, and uh, I became more and more applied with time. So after philosophy, I uh, started studying logic. Uh, so more like applied mathematics. And then from there kind of rolled into uh, natural language processing and from there rolled into like more traditional machine learning uh, stuff. And so that's what I've been doing since. Um, and, and so when I started, uh, my PhD, this was really like the beginning of the, the mainstreamification of AI, where uh, my master uh, mentor at the time, he was saying like uh, neural nets, you know, nobody uses neural nets. I wanted to use neural nets because like this is what the brain does, right? So like, I figured that's a good idea. And he was like, no, 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 like neural nets, they don't work. You should be using like SVMs and, and the things that were cool at the time. And I think this person was really like, uh, you know, on his way out. <laughs> um, and he was very wrong. So this was 2011, 12, when, when really like uh, like AlexNet burst onto the scene and worked to VEC and, and things like that, which are now kind of like canonical, almost old school AI things at the time were brand new and, and really changed the way we think about this stuff. Um, and over the past couple of years, it's just been amazing to see the growth. And uh, I think um, uh, especially, so one of the, the themes now that is, is very popular uh, also, like in the startup community is generative AI and like going beyond just uh, understanding language and like classifying examples and things like that. I'm really trying to generate language for all kinds of very interesting use cases. Uh, so we're in super interesting times and we're really only uh, starting to scratch the surface of what we can do with this technology. Makes sense. And, and can you help um, our, us and our audience like make sense of the lot of new kind of terminology for neural net based models coming our ways, so, you know, transformers, diffusion models, foundation models, LLMs, like, how do you uh, see um, the space kind of uh, uh, panning out? And, and how do you categorize these different models in your own mind? Yeah, so um... I, I the, the easiest way for me to think about this stuff is based on the modality that you're applying the model to. So first of all, foundation models and large language models are sort of the same thing, right? It's a bit of a contentious term, actually, foundation models. So I'm also Stanford affiliated, but some people who are not at Stanford don't like the term. Uh, so I think it's still, still to be decided uh, what we're going to call these things in the long term. Um, but uh, so they're the same thing. And um uh, but maybe foundation model is slightly more general in that uh, may maybe it could also encompass diffusion models. I don't know. We would have to ask Percy uh, Liang who uh, came up with this. Um, but uh, so for, for language, the way we tend to generate language is autoregressively, which means that we do it word by word. And so we have some prefix and then we predict the next word. And then from there, we keep predicting. Um, and, and the recent revolution where, where suddenly AI has gone even more mainstream uh, has been text-to-image uh, applications which rely on diffusion models. So diffusion models, they do have some transformer components. So the way you encode uh, the prompt, so the, the text input, that's often a, a transformer model. But then from there, uh, this process of, of denoising uh, or starting from noise and turning it into an image, 
um, uh, so that process is non-autoregressive. So you do generate the image in one go. So it's really a different paradigm uh, conceptually, like from a, from a science perspective. Got it. And, you know, can you share a little bit more about like what Hugging Face is particularly focused on and how how is the company organized? Yeah. Uh, so what we're focused on is, is always a tricky question because we're we're focused on many things. And I think like the higher level thing is just that we are trying to grow the pie as large as possible with the community. Um, so we're not really focused on, on like monetization things necessarily yet. It's all just about like how can we really uh, like make AI uh, pervasive in the world. And, and, and like, this is where we're heading anyway. And, and I think um, if it continues this way, then Hugging Face will really be a, a central hub um, in this whole uh, development. Um, so, so what we're trying to do is just make sure that people can build cool stuff on top of our platform, on top of our libraries. Um, and and um, so the tagline, so like GitHub for machine learning is one of the ways of putting it, but uh, the mission is really about democratizing the state of the art machine learning approaches. So you mentioned the transformers library, which is kind of the, the classical example by now, uh, but we also have the data sets library, which is super popular, which basically has any data set that was ever made in there by now. So it's super easy for people to just experiment with things. We have a new library called diffusers, uh, which is like transformers, but then for diffusion models, Right. And this has things like stable diffusion in there. You can just like three lines of code and you have a state-of-the-art diffusion model running. Um, there are, uh, is a new library called Accelerate for training on multi-GPU, multi-node uh, settings. So this used to be super difficult right, where you really had right. to deal with, okay, how do I keep all of these different nodes in sync? And now again, it's just three lines of code. So we're just like hoping that uh, uh, we'll benefit from the, the growth and we're just like trying to... Uh, to be a, a central point in, in the community. Got it. And what do most uh, people in the Hugging Face community look like today? Like, you do you have mostly developers, or is it you know developers, uh, data scientists? Like, what is the spread, and how do different people kind of you know use this, leverage it? Like, and do you see that changing in the future? I'm curious. Yeah, so, so it's a great question, actually. So I, I'm always amazed by uh, uh, just kind of the growth that, that we see in the community. It's like really, you can just see how popular AI is and how it's really taking over the world. Uh, but it's all, also really cool to see how diverse that community is. So I think initially it was really just uh, like pure research focus. So the original like PyTorch BERT implementation that kind of started the whole Transformers library um, so, you know, we can talk about the, the history there if you want, but um, so, so that was really focused just on uh, enabling researchers to use a model like BERT. And right. from there, I think because AI became so much more mainstream, it's just a lot of developers now. Uh, there are also more and more lay people using this technology. So on Hugging Face, we have a thing called Spaces. Uh, and you can think of that almost as like a, a YouTube for AI demos in a way. So there's like a training space of the week and things like that. And so Stable Diffusion and Mid Journey and Dream Booth and all of these very cool, like uh, uh, latest and greatest uh, diffusion models, they're up on spaces and you can just interact with them directly. Uh, so that opens up a whole new user base of, of, of just end users of AI uh, technology, which I think is very cool to see. And then we also, I think... Uh, a little bit uniquely in the ecosystem, uh, take a, an ethics first approach. Uh, so we have uh, some some world renowned uh, responsible AI researchers in our team where we're constantly trying to think about how to develop this technology responsibly and how to make sure that the community has the right uh, tools and guardrails for, for doing things the right way. Makes sense. And you no, know, maybe this is a good segue to like the question of open source versus, you know, not. Um, what is what's been kind of the internal debate in the uh, infrastructure and model community on this? Like I, I see, you know, a lot of people saying the only way to do this is open source because you want to democratize it, and there are other folks saying no, just kind of offer like a managed endpoint because that you know takes a lot of the burden off of the developers and founders' plate. So uh, I'm curious, like, what does this debate sound like internally? Obviously, you guys have definitely picked a side, <laughs> but but what are the pros and cons, and and how should 
how should developers who are trying to you know test out and pilot some new features with this tech think about that yeah so so uh i mean i i just think open source is is very important especially with this sort of technology because of the risks and opportunities that it has for like changing the world right so uh, I think it's very unhealthy for uh, a, a model like GPT-3 or, or something like that to be essentially just controlled by a bunch of like Silicon Valley tech bros who can, uh, uh, you know, determine where this technology goes. I think it's much healthier for the world if this is just out there and uh, we can like scrutinize the technology together. Uh, so that's almost like a, like a moral philosophical uh, argument. Um, but uh, so I, I think some people... Um, say that uh, if you develop the, these technologies, then you shouldn't open source them. You should put them behind an API because then you can control them uh, so that people don't abuse the technology for right. like misinformation or things like that. And I think that's a very convenient argument if you want to make money from uh, the technology. Right? So uh, I don't think that they're, uh, they're completely unbiased in their assessment uh, of the risks. Uh, so if you believe in this whole like AGI thing or like closing models and things like that, uh, like maybe some people actually believe in that, but I think some of the top people are uh, almost uh, cynically endorsing that so that they can uh, continue making money from these APIs. Uh, but of course, if you are a developer, it's much easier uh, to just have an API call and talk to a model. Um, and, and so, uh, but you can also do that with open source models where if you wanted to, you could actually look at the model itself. And like in many cases, like we, we've developed uh, Bloom, one of the largest large language models out there right now. And you can also just look directly into the training data and, and try to understand like why the model is generating something. Right. And right. So there is no other model that gives you that capability. And I think in the long term, uh, things like explainable AI and interpretability and trying to like justify why a model does a certain thing, uh, they're going to become more and more important. Right, right. And, and so that it's not just a black box. Uh, which exactly. I think will be really important for especially enterprise adoption, which we should definitely talk about uh, in a bit. So I want to start uh, surfacing a few um, audience questions. Um, this one uh, particularly definitely, you know, top of mind for everybody here. And, and I would you know, maybe ask like the broader version of this, which is what are some of the, you know, best use cases of this out there that, either you know are doing things that no one imagined was possible or are bringing back to life old use cases that you know for example i think one of my favorite ones uh, is the chatbot <laughs> industry because i think a few years ago everyone tried to mainstream mm -hmm. chatbots and they just quite kind of like felt just short enough that you know it was frustrating rather than useful but but now maybe there will be a whole new way given the given the advances in LLM. So I'm curious, what are what are some of the use cases that you are seeing that you think will have the most uh, impact? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting uh, question. Actually, maybe just a very short segue on the topic of chatbots. Um, so uh, the the reason Hugging Face is called Hugging Face, uh, as you can see on my T-shirt, is because the company started as a, a chatbot for right. uh, for teenagers, basically. So kind of like a fun, like less serious chatbot that you could just hang out with and, and enjoy talking to. And from there, uh, at some point, uh, they pivoted to uh, uh, to kind of follow up on the success they had with the open sourcing of the technology that they were using to build the chatbot. Uh, so I think that's always a, a nice side story. Um, but yeah, so so interesting applications. I still think chatbots are, are a little bit too hard for large language models uh, if you want to use them for a goal. Uh, so like the holy grail of chatbots is like goal-oriented dialogue, right? Where you right. can try to achieve something or like make your user happy or uh, sell them something or, or things like that. And, and so the goal orientedness and like really trying to control what these large language models are doing, that's still one of the big open problems for the next two to five years, I think. Um, but uh, so beyond that, uh, I think some of the more obvious things that are going to get disrupted by this new generative AI wave are, are more in the image and, and maybe audio uh, uh, domain where uh, I think in maybe five, so less than five years, we will have like Hollywood length uh, movies generated by AI systems. Uh, 
Um, and uh, so things like Shutterstock and Getty Images, like so those are no longer going to exist. And right? that's really like happening already now. Like, why would you pay for a stock photo if you can generate your own custom one? Um, so, so those are the obvious things. Um, but so I think for me, like as a researcher and someone uh, like originally from NLP, I think it's a very interesting question um, to think about like where where is this really going to get used? Because right now, if you look at the industry, a lot of the generative applications are always with humans in the loop, where it's sort of just right. a writing assistant, right? Um, and um, so I think that's an interesting use case, but it's probably not a super valuable one because any like human who went to school can write. Uh, and so writers are relatively cheap writers of like regular language. Um, so that's why I think like uh, code generation is much more valuable because engineers are much more expensive. So if you can make engineers more uh, productive, then this will give you a much higher value add. Um, but I also think so this generative AI, I think a lot of people are just jumping on the hype train now, but a lot of, a lot of the applications of just AI and NLP in general, uh, are still just about classification. Like if I have a platform, I have to decide like uh, how do I rank the, the content or do I take this down because it hates speech or not. And for that sort of stuff, you still don't want to use generative AI. You still want to use the, the old school uh, thing. So um, I think the whole field is maybe jumping a little bit too much on the generative AI bandwagon where it's kind of unclear what, what the real killer application is going to be. Whereas that I think is much clearer for like code generation and for like image and audio and video generation. Right. And I think one thing you said about like goal orientation and the degree of control needed to only go in one direction as opposed to, you know, what it seems to be good at doing today, which is I don't have a direction. Inspire mm -hmm. me, like show me, you know, 100 options that vaguely meet some criteria I have. I think that's like a very very tangential direction. And I'm curious, like, what does that imply in terms of, you know, how you're thinking about fine tuning to tools or like active learning tools? Like, mm -hmm. I'm assuming that there's a lot of value in being able to do more controlled goal oriented work. So like, what does what does that imply in terms of what people are trying to build to, you know, achieve that uh, particular end? Yeah, yeah. I think one of the obvious uh, answers there is, uh, and you you've seen OpenAI develop this like uh, reinforcement learning from human feedback. Um, and so, if you do this over multiple rounds of learning right. uh, and with different models in the loop, you get a giant data moat, right? So, so I think I'm very bullish on OpenAI uh, just because they have all of this amazing data for how people want to use language models in the first place. Uh, and I think if you compare like the, the open source models that are out there now, so OPT from Meta AI and Bloom from Hugging Face and Big Science. Uh, so those models are maybe not as great as GPT-3, but they're probably quite close to the original GPT-3. But there's right. just been a ton of like product work going into GPT-3 that makes it better. So that, that data mode is really uh, quite valuable. And uh, so I think that's a, a general trend in the field where uh, we are starting... Uh, to see humans and models in loops everywhere, like for data collection. Um, and and uh, so you mentioned active learning, like if you want to do uh, data collection in a smart way you, and you already have a decent model, like a language model where you only need like a couple of examples and you can already get some signal on it, then you can do data collection with the model in the loop. And if you keep updating the model and making it stronger and stronger over time, uh, we have some nice research results uh, recently showing this, then you get a much steeper uh, data curve. So you get like, right. much higher quality data much more quickly. Uh, so that opens up lots of interesting use cases, especially I think for startups where you can just prototype super quickly without having to go like very deep on the technology stack. Mm. I think we have a somewhat related question I would love to surface. So this is from Eleanor says, you know, fine tuning LLMs hasn't quite worked in her experience. So yeah, I would, lo would love a reaction. Like what are examples that were, you know, fine tuning for a specific domain has really improved the quality of the output? Um, anything that comes to mind or any kind of uh, place we can go do more research? Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting question. I mean, uh, 
Uh, so fine to, I think it depends a little bit how you define large language model. So if you include mass language models in that description, so things like BERT and Roberta and DBERTA and kind of like the basic models that everybody builds on top of uh, in like normal NLP, uh, like all of that is fine-tuned. And, and so basically any application using any of these models tends to be fine-tuned. And I think it's sort of the other way around where it's a lot less clear if like few shot or zero shot or in context learning if that actually works. So what, what we found is that that's super high variance and maybe uh, doesn't actually like get you the performance you need, especially if you're already sitting on like a million data points, like why, why wouldn't you fine tune your model? Um, but I think what this question is trying to get at is sort of the intermediate stage where you have like a generic large language model and now you want to fine tune it, let's say on like legal data or like science or something like that. And then after that, use it for something. Um, and I still think that that is under development. Um, and so I have heard of, of some applications of like uh, legal fine tuned versions of things like Bloom. Um, but uh, 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 coincidentally, yesterday or today, uh, Galactica came out, uh, which I think is a very nice example of a very specialized language model uh, that was trained just on scientific data. And this mm -hmm. was uh, done by the papers with code uh, people at Meta AI. And that, that language model is just insanely good. Uh, and, and so surprisingly, it's not just good at scientific data per se, but it's also very good at the big bench, which is one of the benchmarks that you would use to evaluate these models. And it's actually better than uh, Bloom and OPT on that benchmark. So I think that's also something that we're going to see more and more, like right. why don't you train a, a large language model on PubMed or like on some legal corpus or on something else? And like, maybe you don't have to like train it on something generic first and then fine tune it on something. Maybe you can just train directly. Got it. Um, another uh, very related question uh, just around data sets. Uh, let me pull this up. That's a great question from Ivan, which is, you know, like if, I, if you're building a startup, you know, day zero, you don't have any unique data. You don't have any customers to, you know, leverage unique data from. So like, how do you start building something that is still valuable? Like, I'm curious, what are you seeing some of the best startups in the Hugging Face community do this? Like, how do they solve the chicken and egg problem? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the cold start problem, right? And yeah, I mean, uh, uh, so th that's what I was trying to get at, I, I think, with what I just said. Right. Like, uh, it's it's much easier now to prototype uh, the new ideas using this technology without having to develop like a technology stack or gather the, the data. But so for me, a nice example is something like Jasper, uh, which is uh, quite famous now in the Valley for raising a ton of money and being like, a, the, so making more money than open AI using the, the <laughs> right? So that's kind of- So far, there. so far. So far, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, um, uh, so, so I think they were able to to uh, reach their customer base just because this technology was already there, and now they are also sitting on a giant uh, like moat in terms of like their their customer connections, but also the data that they're getting from how their customers right. want to use this, and uh, so they just raised a ton of money. And, and so, if if I was them, uh, I would probably now train up my own GPT three on on my own data, and then you're you're cutting off uh, like the the middleman and just doing it yourself. Uh, so I, I think it, it's a nice way to kind of bootstrap uh, right. using using something generic like a language model. And then once you have enough data, you can start building on top of the language model until you have so much data that you can really build your own thing. Right, right. And you can you can score better because it's you have done a domain specific training as opposed to a generic one. Exactly. So that's that's part of the mode, right? If you just look at it from a data perspective, but I, I think like the user experience is is heavily underrated but super important and so right. if you make it very easy for lay people to use this technology without having to like custom design prompts and things like that then but they can just like tell you what they want and it always works um like that is super super valuable makes sense and so also, the verticals are like uh, so the verticals is where a lot of the money is with this technology right so i i, I still think the jury's out on open ai's business model of just doing like the horizontals kind of foundational right. layer right. because uh, that could be a race to the bottom. Right. Um, and, you know, I think great segue to UX. So I think what, um, you know, we are definitely seeing as, as investors trying to like find the right founders working on this problem is 
uh, a, very often there are problems where we need to like invent a new user experience for the first time. Like maybe there are some analogies, uh, but there are also spaces where there are literally like no existing uh, framework to leverage and you kind of have to think of like what this UX should be from, from the ground up. Mm -hmm. I'm curious like what you are seeing on that front, like what are what are you know great user experiences being invented that you think kind mm -hmm. of really you know show us a path to the future and and what are what are people asking from the hugging face community to enable new user experiences that didn't quite exist before? Yeah, nice question. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think um, that in terms of user experience, so what I enjoy seeing is that like on these hugging face spaces, there's a lot of like super rapid prototyping of just right. cool quirky ideas. And the cool thing about spaces is that uh, so it builds on things like Gradio, which are open source libraries uh, for developing demos very quickly. And so so there's just a lot of prototyping happening. So my favorite one now uh, is uh, I don't know if you've heard of our uh, our places on Reddit. Uh, so it's basically where you can like change a pixel, right? Uh, and then people are just working together to try to make sure that that they have like I don't know their country's flag or things like that. So you can do something like that with stable diffusion, uh, and then uh, so people can like in paint different parts, and then you get these weird like images created by people uh, uh, building stuff with diffusion models. Um, so I, I think that that kind of like just happening organically. Um, I think is super cool. So, so if I uh, would be at a startup, I mean, I am at a sort of a, sort of a later stage startup, but if I was looking for ideas, um, I would very closely look at like what the spaces of the week are and what the trending things are there, because it really gives you really good pulse on like what people are starting to think about in terms of user experience. Makes sense. Yeah, I think, and I'm seeing so many interesting questions. There's of course the UX of like human in the loop, right? Like, is it hey, get me started, then, you know, assert control, how bi-directional can it be between right. kind of human input and model output? And, um, and you know, even things like how do we even organize information in a world where we can create information at like 100,000 times the rate at which we were doing it before? How do we even like organize it, share it, collaborate over it? Yeah. So yeah, I think a lot of opportunity for uh problems to be solved in the application layer like no mm -hmm. no question maybe coming back a little bit to like the still the infrastructure layer i, I love the so this is something i had i hadn't quite uh, kept track of but you talked about i think accelerate like being able to uh, actually do distributed training mm -hmm. uh easily as opposed to kind of what people were mostly doing before where that that was hard like you had to really like hire someone who knew how to do it to be yeah. able to do distributed training so i'm curious like what are the other bits like that that are new um if you could talk us through you know what are what are things that are still hard for developers to implement and where is there opportunity for people to actually work on more compelling tools and Maybe kind of a related uh, question here um, uh, that I that I can I can share. Yeah. But in terms of like just the you know tools for developers, like where are there still problems that you know we should be working on? Um, yeah, I, I thought you were going in a different direction where I where I could maybe talk a little bit about like the the work we're doing on the evaluation and like trying to be a bit more holistic and things like that, but. Now, that uh, that sounds good too. <laughs> I, maybe we can do that first, and then I can yeah. think a little bit while I'm talking about the other questions. Um, yeah, so I think one of the the big problems I still see, and maybe this is also what you were just talking about with like productionizing these technologies, yeah. uh, is around like the safety bias angle. Um, and and I think the the field, like the research field, has been super myopic in its focus on just like pure accuracy and nothing only nothing else right so it's just like we have a static test set and we want to be amazing at the static test set uh and like anything is allowed to to do that uh but that gets you models that are super biased in super weird ways like neural nets are amazing at picking up on biases uh, we have very poor understanding of whether a model is actually biased or not uh so this accuracy accuracy number just doesn't cut it anymore um, so, so there's really an evaluation crisis in the field of AI, because if you look at all of these benchmarks, 
they are basically saturated. So we have surpassed human performance on a lot of these benchmarks. Right. But if you work in the field or if you ever, ever talk to a language model for more than a minute, you know that the technology is, is not even close to human level still. Um, so we have a ton of work to do, but we don't know how to measure the progress we're making because we've saturated all of the, the prior benchmarking. Right. We uh, need uh, new benchmarks that so we need new benchmarks. Account. So I've been doing some work in like trying to have continuously updating benchmarks. So things like Dynabench.org, uh, where we like have humans and models in the loop continuously doing this. Um, but at Hugging Face, we've also built tools. Uh, so there's the evaluate library, which makes it very easy for people to also do like fairness and bias measurements and to look at efficiency, look at like confidence intervals of models to really get a, a proper sense of how good the model really is. Um, and uh, uh, we're trying to to solve the kind of reproducibility crisis as well that exists in the field where uh, if everybody evaluates things in their own way uh, or if you uh, have a company and you are the CEO and like your data science team says we have this amazing like 10% increase, uh, you want to be able to validate that uh, without them right. telling you that they were great. Right? You want to right. do that independently. Um, and so we've been uh, working on this evaluation on the hub solution where we have models and data sets and metrics, and you can basically evaluate any model on the hub on any uh, data set using any metric. Um, and uh, so I, we really think that this is the way to, uh, to do proper evaluation, especially when we start caring about the whole uh, picture. So holistic evaluation of models, um, which I think will be like a big thing in the future. Right. Um, so, so that is like something like Accelerate, but then in a bit of a different space. Right. I think these are kind of like really important for enterprise adoption, given that these companies have just as much to lose as they have to gain if something goes wrong. For example, I recently heard that uh, Bank of America has said, hey, if your tool is an AI tool as a vendor, uh, we want to go through this like nine month long pilot uh, for any AI tool because we want to make sure that uh, from a copyright base on a copyright basis on a bias basis we won't get into trouble and I think that just shows like yes they you know there's a lot of productivity gains that they are excited about but also because they're a big company and you know can get into lawsuits they're also worried about risk yeah. right and and rightfully so and I think you know, that's one example but we're probably going to see that across the board from large companies evaluating AI vendors mm -hmm. how do you think about you know talked a little bit about bias but how do you think about the issue of copyright and kind of almost lineage right because even if something that's been generated is technically unique mm -hmm. it could still have you know a lot of latent space overlap with something else so is it you know where do you draw the line? Is it 90% overlap? Is it 20%? Like, yeah. are, are you all thinking about that issue of kind of, you know, how to how to interpret copyright, how to interpret IP? Yeah, so so we have some uh, legal experts uh, at Hugging Face uh, who also work with the Big Science Initiative on, on developing new licenses. So there's a responsible AI license and, and things like that. Uh, which I think are really great for for the responsible usage of AI. Um, but uh, so so I mean, uh, going back to the previous question about like what are the, the areas where we can innovate? Like this is a very obvious one, right? So uh, the technology is here. Like how do we understand the risks of the technology? How do we mitigate uh, safety issues? How do we like speed up the deployment of generative AI models in a way where people actually believe that it's not going to do anything weird? Um, so that's a huge space. Uh, for development, I think. Um, but uh, um, sorry, what was your, your question here again? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm curious, like what the science oh, behind it uh, right. behind it can be. Yeah. yeah. So 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 the copyright um, question, I think, is interesting. I mean, I'm not a lawyer, and so I I don't think I, I should like uh, give like a strong opinion. But um, from the people I've been talking to, everybody seems to think that this will all just be fair use. And that is very hard to uh, argue otherwise. Um, and so there are, are maybe some issues with like downstream like licensing issues. Like we, we've all seen like the lawsuit against uh, um, uh, uh, like uh, OpenAI GitHub uh, style things. And so, um, but uh, I, I think for like general text data and and uh, for also for code and basically anything that you can scrape off of the internet, 
uh, it's very hard to argue a non-fair use case, I think, and it's sufficiently derivative. Uh, so it's not, I wouldn't be worried about that too much. The only case where I'm not really sure um, is for videos. Uh, because uh, if you look at like what videos exist on the internet, they tend to um, uh, have a very skewed like power law distribution where like 99% of all videos is on YouTube. Um, and then you have like Vimeo and then like a bunch of porn websites. And then there's like a very, right. very small percentage of videos that are just out there on the internet. Um, and so YouTube has very uh, uh, heavy restrictions on its like terms of use. So you can't just go and scrape YouTube, train a model on that, and then like go and make money off of that model without, at some point, uh, I think YouTube coming after you. Um, so there, I'm a bit less clear. But for other other use cases, I think it should be fine. But uh, so like uh, so attribution. Um, so so maybe you've seen like Deviant Art. Uh, so the, they they recently have their own. Uh, diffusion model trained on their own like user basis data and there was a lot of like, consternation about this um, but uh, so I think that uh, that is an interesting model uh, uh, like that we're going to start seeing this more and more and um, uh, the only re real way around this I, I think is to be very explicit in the attribution so if you are generating something on deviant art saying like in the style of user x Right. Then user X should probably get some royalties or something for whatever it generates. Right. So I, I think like as a field, we're trying to figure that out now. And just from the like, like the mathematical perspective, like what is the um, what is the capability the model has to say, okay, this is this is the lineage of this output. Like here's how much credit you know ABC should get, whether or not it was fair use and there mm -hmm. are royalties involved. Uh, are the models already capable of laying out kind of the attribution themselves? Or is that also something that needs to be worked on in terms of like, what is the benchmark? How do we define? Um, yeah, so the, yeah, the benchmark. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, so there, there aren't any direct benchmarks of that. So it would be interesting to develop that, I think. Um, but there are ways of doing this already. Um, so when I was still at Facebook, we developed this system called Retrieval Augmented Generation. And one of the, the big selling points of, of doing these uh, so-called semi-parametric approaches, so where you have a big index of data and then you have like a reader model on top of that index that makes decisions, uh, then you can say like, okay, like I'm, I'm saying this word now because I found this example here. And like for this example, maybe you know like who owns it, right? So you could think of like a, a giant index of images from like divine art or whatever uh, and you know which user own, owns which image and then uh, you can have your model try to retrieve from the index which images it wants to take inspiration from and that's how you kind of uh, divide the, the royalties accordingly I think. Makes sense. Um, I'll pull up one more question that kind of takes us into more of the future which is okay what you know, what are some limitations? And I would say also not just limitations, but uh, current benchmarks around cost, performance, et cetera. Like what, what, what does kind of the status quo look like versus what you would predict, um, you know, the direction we are going in, like where can we be in two years, both in terms of, you know, new breakthroughs um, as well as just, overall kind of cost and performance. For example, right now, I think, you know, in terms of end user experience, you still have like a, you know, significant waiting time for uh, output. You still have, uh, you know, significant cost per inference call. Uh, so would love to hear, you know, some of the more uh, like predictions on your end of like what that could look like. You know, is there a, is there a Moore's law for for AI that that is being developed, or um, is it still hard, very hard to predict? Ooh. yeah. Well, the Moore's law question is sort of a separate one. <laughs> uh, so I do think there is a Moore's law in terms of scaling uh, compute and data, um, and and so I think what we're going to continue seeing is uh, that we're. Uh, people will be scaling more and more with compute and data. And so the, the, the standard players in this, like Google and OpenAI, they're the places where you're going to see this stuff coming from. And I think uh, one of the interesting topics now is 
like what emerges at what sort of level of scale. So you can really clearly see kind of like insights emerging in these models when they uh, are trained at a certain scale. And if they're like smaller than that, they just never get there. So they never actually get these emergent abilities. So the real question is like, what will emerge when we uh, go 100x uh, further in terms of compute? Uh, it's still an open question, I think. And what we're finding out, I think, as a community is uh, how important data is in this equation. So it's not just about the compute that you throw at it or like uh, the, the size of your model or the number of parameters. It's also about the quality of the data that goes into that model. Um, and, and so the higher the quality of that data is, probably the steeper your scaling law can be. And, and so that's like a very clear sort of alpha you can have over your competitors. If you have a steeper scaling law, then you can get there faster or you can train for the same amount and end up with a strictly better model. Um, but in terms of the current limitations, I, I, again, I, I would try to um, uh, split that by the modalities that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in like text to image technologies, uh, it's still very hard to uh, generate hands. Right? So very obvious things. Uh, and uh, like just making sure that you have uh, the right amount of fingers uh, is very hard for a diffusion model. Um, and so the same with faces, making them actually look realistic, uh, generating text in images is still completely not solved. Um, so there are just a, a couple of basic things that I think that we have to do. Uh, and these will require like model breakthroughs. It's not very obvious how to do that. So one possible explanation or one possible direction is like, uh, uh, train on even more images and for longer with more compute and a bigger model and then like the ability to count fingers might emerge um, mm -hmm. but maybe we need like real algorithmic breakthroughs uh, to get that to work and I, I think um, so in the, so the next modality that we're all going to focus on this video like I think everybody knows uh, that this is coming uh, but there you have a new set of problems with how, how do you like move the frames without jitter and things like that uh, and if we can do it for videos, we can probably also do it for games and, and, and other sort of more uh, interactive uh, environments or the metaverse maybe even uh, could be fun. And then for like pure large language models, uh, the, the real issue still is the controllability of this. Um, so how can we actually get it to do something really useful without a human in the loop? Um, and, and so... Uh, yeah, the jury's still out on, on how to do that exactly. Maybe we'll see diffusion models for NLP at some point because uh, the nice thing about diffusion uh, and the fact that it's non-autoregressive means that you can control it much better. So, so one of the problems with autoregressive models is that they're very hard to control because they also need to just learn to predict that the next word is the uh, and like this sort of mundane stuff. Right? So if you can uh, uh, like abstract that away, you have much more control over what the model does. Um, and then you mentioned like latency. Uh, latency is just one of the aspects of, of the user experience and, and just user friendliness for this technology is also uh, going to be a, an interesting research area of just like, just like what is the right way to, to do this? Because um, people are very weird, especially when it comes to language. Um, like we anthropomorphize anything like, you know, like there you can like name your i mean you name your like dog and things but some people name like you you can name anything in, in your house right and uh so so we anthropomorphize just uh, or we ascribe intentionality in the philosophical uh, uh, way of putting it uh, to any kind of object um and so when the object produces language which is like the quintessential human uh, property then we are very very strongly inclined to ascribe uh, intentionality and uh, so that, that comes with very um, important uh, implications for how humans interact with AI systems. Um, and so we will assume that the AI systems are like humans because that is what we do with other humans. Um, and if they're not, then we're going to get caught out in, in very weird ways. Uh, so, uh, so the limitation is, is still that AI systems are not really like humans yet. And the more right. we can make them like humans, the better they will be uh, in our interactions with uh, those systems. Makes sense. I think there's a specific question that you kind of addressed, but I want to uh, bring it up anyway, since it's kind of related, which is, you know, is this, are we going to get bigger and bigger models? Because you said that there might be some problems that are solved that way. It's not clear yet. So I wanted mm -hmm. to just surface this uh, specific question since it's related. 
Uh, so the, the answer to the second question here, are they going to get bigger and bigger? Yes, absolutely. Um, so, so it's just very obvious that this will keep getting us gains and like it's not really plateauing off yet. Um, so it would be stupid to not keep going, especially for the people who have the compute to, to try. Um, so that's definitely going to happen. But that, so that's kind of a question of training, right? And, and that's like a one-off cost where you just invest very heavily in this model. But now the, the real uh, um, monetization question, uh, I suppose, is like, how do you do efficient enough inference uh, with this model so that it's fast enough for people to use it in interesting use cases and it's cheap enough for you to do it? So uh, open AI's uh, APIs are amazing, but they're also super expensive, I think, uh, if you ask me. Um, and so that's probably because they have some like subsidized compute and things like that. But if they didn't have that, then I, I don't think uh, they would be very uh, profitable. Um, so there's a there's a huge topic there of like model efficiency. And there's also a lot of research happening there around like model distillation, model quantization, uh, model compression. Uh, all that sort of good stuff uh, where we can try to move away from uh, like uh, GPU based uh, batched inference uh, towards like CPU based, which is much more efficient or maybe even having like dedicated chips. Right. So I think if you look at the big players, uh, including things like TikTok, uh, but definitely Meta also, they're, they're just building very custom AI accelerators for recommendation systems and things like that. Right. So like real custom hardware for one specific use case during inference time. Makes sense. Um, I think maybe one good new question to start wrapping us up with, um, which you know definitely comes up a lot in the investor community. I think mm -hmm. uh, the, a lot of founders have talked to say, okay, yes, this is like the first question we get from from uh, investors when we say, okay, we are going to be using this open source model or that one. Mm -hmm. um, so curious from your side of the table, <laughs> you know, right. as you're, you're trying to democratize access to this, how do you think about competitive modes for the developers who are building applied AI? Yeah, so uh, I mean, I, so I have the same question, actually. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think both of us have this question right now. We might, we might not, nobody knows the exact answer to this, yeah. but we're all guessing. No, but so so I, I think I mean it's a super interesting question. So you can tackle it from many different angles. I think like one is the the open source angle. Like uh, so, around open source technology, is there really a moat? Um, and uh, I think there are very good examples of very strong moats around open source technology. Uh, so if you think of like the Linux kernel uh, and uh, and uh, the amount of value that that has created uh, from an economic sense is it's amazing, right? Um, and uh, so all of these companies have different kinds of modes. So they're not like pure technology modes, but they're also like network effects and data modes and, and um, uh, like uh, uh, like customer modes and usability modes and branding modes. And so, uh, yeah, I don't know if that's still the correct usage of the word mode. Um, but uh, so I, I, I think it doesn't have to just be about the technology. Uh, so I think a lot of startups are, are making mistakes where they think that... Um, like they need to be an AI company uh, and they need to develop like new algorithms or like new models and do fancy new stuff. Um, and I think there are only a, a few people who are really good at doing this fancy new stuff and there are only a, a very few uh, places and the rest of it is just much more boring kind of product work. So uh, I would encourage startup founders to think much more seriously about the product rather than the technology underlying it. Uh, and like, how can you build a moat around the product and not just like, okay, I have like this AI thing and I have some data and some model stuff. Makes sense. I will take one last question um, uh, from Cara where, uh, you know, I think we touched on this a little bit before, but like, what, what does it mean to have like a good domain specialized model? And I think you brought this up, which is there is a lot of opportunity here, but I, I think uh, maybe a, a next level question from me is, um, you know, what if someone is trying to build a domain specialized model, like what do you see as an effective approach? How much should they lean on, you know, bootstrapping based on the existing monolithic model versus, you know, where do they start branching off? Yeah, um, I, I think uh, that's an interesting open question and we will soon get more answers when GPT-4 comes out. Uh, so if GPT-4, which is rumored to be very multimodal, 
uh, if that is going to be so amazing that everybody wants to only use that as their like monolithic model for all domains to build on, um, then um, then that might change the way people think about this. Uh, so then maybe it's not worth like specializing too much. Uh, and you just wait for the next GPT uh, coming out. Um, so like the size of the step change there is going to be very useful signal, I think, for all of us working in, in this uh, industry. Um, but as it stands at the moment, uh, I think there's a there's a ton of value in doing domain specialization, um, and you can build on top of monolithic models, uh, especially when you're bootstrapping. Um, and then uh, at some point, like what, uh, uh, with the commoditization of this technology that is currently happening, it might be very easy for you to just like swap out the API call to OpenAI to an API call to like Cohere or uh, Hugging Face or wherever. Uh, and uh, so you won't have to rely too much on their underlying technology. You can just have something on top of it uh, in smart ways. But then we're going back to this ultimate question that we've uh, kept talking about here, which is how do you really control these models? Right? Um, so maybe like, if you can control the model in an interesting domain specific way, uh, right. maybe that's where the real value add is. Um, right. But like this verticalization uh, uh, point here, I, I definitely think that uh, the, the vertical is where, where the real money is going to be in the long term. Uh, so OpenAI and their strategic partnership with Microsoft, I mean, like Microsoft is one of the best vertical players in the world, I think. So uh, and maybe at some point OpenAI will start uh, selling this stuff themselves directly to customers. And are there benefits uh, around, you know, cost and performance when it comes to specialized models? Um, what do you mean? So, for example, you know, if you are doing a uh, using a monolithic model versus you are uh, you have a more domain specialized model, would you anticipate that, like done well, there will be benefits mm. in uh, cost and performance, like lower latency, you know, better infrastructure, cost overall, or or not really? Possibly, I I think that really depends on the application. So we mentioned like code models. Uh, like there, the value add is so big that it's really worth like training right. a specialized model for it. Right? Right. Uh, but you could use something like, so in the end, like code is just like language. So you could have one language model that generates code as well. Uh, but I think it's obvious that, that you want to be as good as possible in that niche. Right. Um, right. But in some of the more mundane cases, I think it's a lot less clear. Uh, like, I don't know, like creative writing or things like that. Like maybe you just want to use a generic thing. So uh, it really depends on on like, so in investor terms, like what your total addressable market right. is when you actually specialize it. Right? Makes sense. Awesome. Well, this was incredibly uh, uh, useful uh, for me and I think for everybody here. So thank you so much for doing this, uh, though. My pleasure. And, yeah, uh, pleasure. Maybe as we wrap up, like, you know, if people are getting started, want to learn, what would you recommend? Like, what are good ways to plug in? What are kind of the go-to resources you would recommend everybody uh, takes a chance to explore uh, after this event? Yeah, so um, I think a, a good way to stay up to date is to follow people on Twitter. So you can follow me on Twitter. I'm just my, my name. So that would keep on, on Twitter. Uh, and I think like there's a, a bunch of very interesting people you can follow to really stay up to date with what's happening in the field. Uh, but if you're just getting started and you want to like to feel like you're a part of like where the field is going, I, I would recommend looking at uh, like the Hugging Face course, for example, uh, which is really uh, like designed for people just entering the field who have some like tech knowledge, but not necessarily AI knowledge. And, and if you just go through that course, you'll you'll be up to speed in no time in, in uh, like really cutting edge uh, state of the art AI. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, we obviously, if you're working on uh, AI native startup, please hit us up. I'm Sandhya at unusual.vc and pretty much, you know, focused on, on this for the foreseeable future. <laughs> I think we'll, we'll probably do a few more sessions like these over the next few months every time we have another big breakthrough. But thank you so much for uh, kicking us off. This was incredibly useful. Thank you. All right. Thank you.